volatility exists. So yeah, I don't know what's what's the solution. How do we uh, how do we encourage the world to uh, you know think in more stochastic terms? I grew up in Australia, and if you want to know if you know two flies are crawling up a wall, which one's going to get there first? You let people bet on it. It's really that simple. <laughs> right? Let's not overcomplicate this. Probability does not exist, right? <laughs> unless unless somebody's betting on it. <laughs> Welcome back to LOCAD TV. I'm your host, Connor, and as always, I'm joined by LOCAD founder, Joannes Vemorel. Today's guest is Peter Cotton. He's a senior VP and chief data scientist at Intech Investment. And today he's going to talk to us about probabilistic forecasting and possibly how to beat the stock market. Peter, welcome to LOCAD. Thank you for having me. At LOCAD, we'd like to know who we're talking to. So, Peter, could you tell us a little bit about your background, what it is you get up to at Intech Investment? Oh, sure. I guess I would describe myself as a kind of career quant, worked on the buy side and the sell side, um, had a brief stint as an entrepreneur building a data company. And uh, I currently uh, spend my time, of course, trying to predict things that won't surprise you, um, and also uh, trying to, to push uh, the frontiers of portfolio theory. And I suppose we should say right at the start, congratulations on your recent performance in the M6 competition. I believe you placed in the top 10, is that correct? I, I did. I, I'm not sure if it's uh, if it's my credit or just the credit of uh, all those uh, option traders and the clients who support them. Um, so it wasn't in some respects it wasn't my work at all. Uh, I was just a a mere conduit from one one source of predictive power to another. For the audience, the, the M6 yeah. was actually uh, 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 the sixth situation of a very well-known series of forecasting competition, where um, the, the the goal is literally to uh, make prediction and uh, the, 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 the competition works as follows. There is a, a, a data set that is made public, then there are certain set of rules and people have to make prediction, typically in the form of time series forecast, which comes in various flavors. Uh, and uh, in, the, in this case, it was like um, uh, there was a probabilistic aspect. The last two competition iteration, the M5 and the M6, had some um, probabilistic element to it in the, in the sort of the rules of what, how, what it, does it take to actually win um, the, the, the competition. And in the specific case on the M6, it was an iterated game, so it was like 12 iteration where people had to submit the results and uh, the competition would move forward and they had plenty of rules to establish who performed best and actually uh, outperformed the market. And that's, that's a very, very, I would say, demanding exercise and I would say um, uh, very, uh, and, and very brutal exercise because there is very little room to, uh, um, I would say, to, uh, um, uh, to, to fake your results. And by the way, there were real prizes at the key for, for, for the, the, the top, I think something like top three or maybe top five contenders of the competition. Well, my understanding is that each iteration of the M competition is different. So Peter, what was the theme of the M6? I mean, what was the expressed goal? So the, the goal of the organizers in a broad sense was to investigate the efficient markets hypothesis. Um, which, which states in, in its various uh, forms, um, put briefly, it's hard to beat the market. <laughs> That's the efficient market <laughs> hypothesis. And, uh, and the reason, of course, um, it's hard to beat the market is that there's um, a lot of financial incentive for doing so. And there's plenty of smart people who've spent the last 40 years of their careers um, trying to do that and building up teams to do it and hoovering up all the data they can find uh, to do that. It's undoubtedly true that the uh, best thing predicted on planet Earth is, you know, probably the price of Google stock or something. Um, everything else is a rung below that in terms of prediction. Uh, so that was one stated goal of the organizers. Um, another was to, one of their stated goals was to try to investigate whether people who could predict well would also be able to turn that into sensible diversified portfolios. Um, that performed according to some metric that we can quibble with. Um, so I think those were the, the main two goals of the organizers, at least as, as I understood them. And what exactly is it that your model did that other participants failed to do? Well, what was different about my entry is that um, from a philosophical perspective, uh, I, I viewed 
the problem was one of finding whatever data was relevant. Of course, other people would, would view that in that respect. But I think what's different is that people sometimes overlook the fact that data can take on the form of implied uh, numbers or numbers which are implicit in the existing markets. Now, if you look at the M6 competition, uh, what we were asked to do was try to predict the probability that a given stock or ETF would have returns in, let's say, the second quantile compared to its other peers out of 100 after one month. So you ask yourself, what, what, what really goes into determining whether a stock is going to finish in the, in the second quantile of its peers? Well, if you have a view on direction of the stock, that's going to push up the probability of finishing the top two quantiles, obviously. But if you don't have an opinion on the stock, which I personally didn't, then the main thing that's going to influence whether you end up in the first quantile or the third is the volatility of the stock. Um, so I would argue to first order this was really a contest in predicting volatility, uh, not direction of the stock, uh, perhaps somewhat contrary to the maybe the stated hypothesis of the organizers, but that's fine. It's a, it's a laboratory experiment. Um, so, you know, what I did was I said, well, look, there's already a source of incredibly good information about the volatility of stocks. It's called the options market. So I will simply look at the options market and uh, instead of forecasting volatility myself, I'll just use those numbers. That's pretty much all I did. Uh, so you could think of my entry as really just a market benchmark, perhaps not the same market benchmark that people would anticipate. The organizers have put in a different, weaker market benchmark. Um, but that, that was mine. And I said, uh, look, uh, it's uh, very difficult to come up with better forward-looking estimates of how far a stock is going to move than um, that that would be implied by the options market. Because if you could do that, you could make money by buying and selling options. Of course, there are some people who make money selling, buying and selling options. Um, not me. I not you. Money, but... But, but there's a lot, you know, it, it drives the market to a very efficient state. And, and so uh, that's what I thought was fun about this contest. It, it was a way of taking a community of um, uh, data scientists, forecasters, and, and some quants and saying, look, um, here's, here's kind of, I would say, in large part, and I'm happy to be corrected on this, but in large part, most of them wouldn't come at it from this kind of quantitative finance perspective, and pitching them against the options market. Uh, so you could view it as that kind of battle. And I thought that was really fun to do that. So that's uh, that's what I did. And I was, I was actually a little surprised at how high I finished up on the leaderboard. Um, I think I was within 0 0.002 Briar score of being in the money, <laughs> actually winning, <laughs> winning some money. So agonizingly close. Um, but the main point was just to see kind of, you know, would I beat 70% of participants? Would I beat 80%? Turned out I beat 96% of participants. I was a little surprised by that, to be honest. The interesting thing for me, I mean, coming from a more um, uh, supply, from a supply chain background, is that I'm always so incredibly impressed by how you know finance is literally decades ahead of supply chain as far as those sort of things are going, because you see, my main battle at Locad, the sort of things that we push, is that volatility exists. We are still in the battle of whether it does exist at all, because there is in, in supply chain circles there is plenty of people who say you know what, um, let's forecast down to four decimals correct um, how much we are going to sell next year. And then if you had you know, your, your absolutely perfect sales forecast, then everything becomes a matter of orchestration. You can decide exactly how much you're going to produce, how much you need to buy, how much, uh, you, uh, how much do you need to allocate in terms of inventory. So if, if you had perfect forecasts, then all the execution to deliver you know, the, the goods and services and whatnot becomes just a, a, a pure matter of mundane orchestration. And, um, and when Locad, Locad started to, to push for probabilistic forecast uh, in supply chain a decade ago, it was absolutely not new in the sense that uh, decades has been doing that with value at risk for a you know, long time, three, four decades at least. But uh, the, the, the key idea is that first we had to kind of give up on the idea that we will have a perfect forecast. So we, there is this first step is acknowledging that uh, you, you don't know all there is to be known about the future. It seems like fairly obvious to people coming from finance, but in supply chain, they are still, it's still uh, uh, 
absolutely not widely acknowledged that you can't get to a perfect forecast. And then there is the color, a corollary that once you accept that you have this uncertainty, is that uncertainty doesn't mean that you don't know anything. You can, you can have both uncertainty and to quantify the structure of this uncertainty with volatility and whatnot. It has, it's not because it's, uh, it is uncertain that is unknowable. There are things to be known and about the structure of uncertainty. And that's, uh, and that's by the way, when we say um, probabilistic forecast, what we are using it for from a supply chain perspective is literally uh, to say that, well, you don't adjust, you, you don't take the same decisions facing, you know, immense spread or very concentrated uh, uncertainty. And that's ju that just that. It's not like super, super sophisticated, but it's just that uh, when you're facing enormous volatility, you're not exactly approaching the risk quantitatively the same way than when it's, it's, uh, it's almost a sure thing comparatively. Yes, isn't that true that... Um it's it's taken still taking decades um, to try to get their message through and 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 to their credit there are people in you know managerial science who have tried to sort of you know popularize this notion of you know like Sam Savage you know floor of averages and so forth great catchphrase like trying to encourage people to understand that the, the you know taking one path or an average value or something is is going to lead you into trouble um, whereas of course in finance um, you've had all these incredibly fine-grained notions of convexity, risk, and so forth for years. Uh, yeah, it's amazing how different that is. It, it's a, I've, I've noticed it too because, um, uh, you know, it, it, it micro prediction the, the competitors, which is sort of like a um, sped-up version of the M6 in some respects. Um, the competitors have to provide distributional predictions, and uh, you know, if you're coming from Kaggle or somewhere else, and maybe not familiar with that, um, or maybe with the with the motivation for it. Um, so yeah, I don't know what's what's the solution. How do we uh, how do we encourage the world to uh, you know think in more stochastic terms and uh, get that get that really working in, you know on people's uh, spreadsheets or, or their decision making or whatever. It's not so easy. Absolutely, and and I I believe one of the the ingredient that is kind of mudding the picture further is that at least you know again from my background that is from enterprise software in this broad field of, 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 of supply chain is that the buzzword of the decade has been AI. And, uh, and, um, and then interesting because obviously, as soon as you have AI, whatever that could mean, then you're supposedly having you know, such a superior grasp about the future. And, um, and, and it's very interesting because you see, for, for my own very personal take is that uh, AI is just you know, a buzzword to mask your own incompetence with something. Once you're very competent, you tend to call it something else. You know, you, 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 you call it an hyperparametric model or um, uh, gradient booster trees or whatever. There is like a technical name of what is it that you're doing. So when you're you saying AI is just like mumbo jumbo of some stuff I don't understand. But the, the interesting thing is that it seems to me that um, uh, very frequently when you're facing something that is incredibly chaotic and complex, and that has been you know, kind of my experience and also our results with the M5, is that LOCAD did very well with a method that all in all was orders of magnitude simpler than those sort of things that qualifies as, I would say, AI-driven methods. And uh, what, what's, what's, what I found very interesting with the, your micro-prediction thing prediction approach is that I believe that you did something that was in essence very similar in, the, in its simplicity that facing that the, the sort of proper behavior when facing something that that is um, incredibly complex uh, that is that has an erraticity that is inc incredibly difficult to rationalize the sort of reasonable move for, uh, path forward is instead of, of, of doubling down on the complexity is on, on the contrary to step back and trying to find um, something relatively simple and robust. And uh, I don't know, what, what is your take? You see, it's this, this approach that the more complex and, and chaotic and erratic, the, should you have a system that 
reflect all of that and by having a, a, a complexity that is even greater than the system that you're trying to approach, or on the contrary, you don't go the other way around, say, due to the fact that I have this thing that I barely understand, I need to have something very simple that I do understand <laughs> to kind of steer me through this, this storm, in a way. So I undertook a, a couple of experiments in this regard. Um, one of them was I was keen, of course, to have as many um, good algorithms as I could find from the, the open source world uh, for time series prediction. Um, and you know, for those who don't know, basically I, I, I try to maintain these open source packages that makes it fairly easy to, to benchmark things or, or try to figure out what, you know, what's a good time series for your purpose. Um, and then some of those are given a kind of autonomous life of their own. And they basically just look at all the, all the, the data that gets passed through micro prediction and they try to see if they're good at predicting something. And if they are, then they, you know, basically enter their own little contests. You know, so uh, micro prediction is sort of like, uh, kind of like the M6 for algorithms. It's, it's the, the, the autonomous version of, of, of this, um, typically on, on higher frequencies. And so of course, Myself and all the other people who, who sort of participate in this in this game, um, you know, we start to develop views over over time of what actually works and what's robust across different situations. Um, uh, another thing I did was just try to do some offline benchmarking of um, univariate time series, so pretty narrow scope, um, but nonetheless, as you know, there's there's probably twenty or fifty uh, Python packages out there. For time series prediction and um, in various levels of popularity and um, most of them wrap other packages that wrap other packages that wrap TSA stats models, right? <laughs> it's kind of like, I feel bad for the maintainers of TSA stats models and always building things. Um, and, you know, there's some novel things in this space, but it's interesting that um, a lot of the novel things, uh, when you actually benchmark them against the classic stuff, and you do it, um, you try to do it in a way where the application is purely autonomous. So there's no, you know, going back and forth with historical data, no p-hacking, no nothing. Um, you get fed data live, you eat it, you predict that that's it. Um, and the data is fresh because it's coming from the, the micro prediction platform. Uh, the leaderboards are kind of interesting. In fact, you know, I, so I, I maintain with, with scare quotes, time series, um, uh, ELO ratings for all these algorithms and the, and the sub methods within each package. Uh, but what do you think comes out on top? Is it uh, is it the most popular packages like Facebook Profit? <laughs> no. <laughs> is it uh, you know um, is it various attempts to use neural networks? Uh, no. <laughs> it's none of that stuff, right? I mean, unsurprisingly, what ends up on top is you take. Um, kind of a simple, fairly simple, precision-weighted averages of recent performance of a bunch of simple models. And it just, you know, that's, that's your benchmark. Yeah, and of course, those simple models include things like auto arima and their variants or even simpler things. Yeah. And, and for the audience, I think what you're pointing out, and I'm just going to maybe explain for the audience that is not that familiar. I mean, piaking is, is a very real problem. Uh, it's, it's the idea that uh, as soon as you venture into the realm of um, I would say, fancy models. Uh, there are actually a lot of them, a lot of them. And then, uh, uh, and the, the sort of, the space of all those mathematical models is gigantic. And thus, when you have like a data set, you can nearly always find a model that, you know, accidentally perform well. And mm -hmm. by the way, in supply chain, it is even easier than in the financial markets just because there is like good years and bad years. I mean, most products have a seasonality. So if, if you have like a, if you're selling ice cream and there is like a very warm summer, uh, you're going to have, you know, um, s numbers that are higher. So if you have just a model that sometimes overshoot and another model that, I mean, a model that on average overshoot and a mo another model that on average undershoot, if you do something like, uh, um, a test, um, you, you will come up with a model that seems to perform exceedingly well on the data that you have just because you had some basic factors that are steering all the results up or down and that they, there is like a hidden co-variable and, uh, and that gives you uh, a very distorted takes on what sort of, of, um, what sort of performance that you have on the data versus what you will get if you, if you play further with this model 
in, in the future. And, uh, and that leads us to the overfitting problem, that is the more general version. And p-hacking is just you know, a specific way of cherry picking dimensions and, and hypothesis uh, so that you can have something that, uh, that end up passing some statistical test of confidence while actually there is none. It's just, uh, it's just that you've, you've actually tested a lot of hypotheses. So, and, and that's, by the way, the point, again, for the audience, the point of those for forecasting competition, uh, all of them, is that um, the, the design prevents you to a very large extent of doing that, of, of, of doing these things where you engineer a model that works very, very well on the data that you have but performs poorly on, on the future data. The, the, the point of the forecasting competition is that the, 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 the data is only released after people submit the results. So they can't, they can't tweak their model to you know, engineer fake results. That, that's right. Most, I mean, most academic literature comprises a tiny little closed contest run by where the judge is the same person as the entrant and the entrant decides who else is allowed to enter and who isn't. And then they run the race 10 times and then they publish the result. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely yes. ridiculous. Um, why is there even an empirical literature? I don't know. Um, I spend my time trying to mock the, the very notion of an empirical literature. Why do you have this? Um, you know, why publish a paper on the efficacy of a model in something in real time if the paper isn't going to update itself? Right? <laughs> I mean, it, we, we, I don't know um, what we can do to, to, to get away from this. Unfortunately, um, uh, as we all know, and the economists say, the joke about incentives, um, you know, the problem isn't that they don't work, it's that they work too well. And so if the only incentive is publishing papers, that's what you'll get. Um, if the only incentive is a slightly weird metric for the M6 for the investment side of the contest, you're going to get, you're going to find, uh, you know, three out of 200 people who will find that, that corner solution or the way to game it, right? That's the way it goes. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I advocate instead of publishing papers, people should um, take their algorithm um, and run it forever. And we should encourage an infrastructure that companies could share in that would enable these algorithms to travel from one business problem to the next and find out if they actually do well. And uh, if these methods uh, that are coming along these days, and some of them are very ingenious in machine learning, are capable of truly performing well out of sample. And if there's enough data for them to really do that, there's going to be enough data to autonomously determine whether they're good or not. And so we don't really need um, humans with their strong opinions and strong priors and, and, and self-interest and gatekeeping and all the rest of it to determine which algorithm should work for a given business problem often. Um, at least in my domain. In your domain, it's a little more challenging because you have longer-term forecasts. Um, but in my domain, if you're saying, what's, what's going to work for you, you know, predicting how many customers will turn up in the next five minutes or how many cars will pass an intersection in the next two minutes, that's a large data problem. Um, we shouldn't have... There's no reason for people with their PDFs and all the rest of it to get in the way. That would be my opinion. Let's just turn everything into an M6 but speed it up, <laughs> or better, turn everything into an options market. Yes, and that the interesting thing is that, again, um, for me, the finance is just the, the sort of practice, and I say in the good sense, because you see, there, there is this general perception of the public that, um, you know, um, if you have a, a villain in a movie, it's going to be the finance guy. And, the options and, trader, yeah. and, um, and but. Uh, my, my take is that um, th those markets are an exercise in rationality. I mean, you, you, if, you, if you're profoundly irrational, you just go bankrupt. And, uh, and you know, it's, if only people that can maintain a very, very high level of rationality in what they do over a long period of time do, do not go bankrupt. It's, 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 it's a very, very unforgiving environment. Uh, and even small inefficiencies are very... Quickly, if you have if if you if you have some competitors that are year after year, you know, a few percent more efficient than you, then people reallocate their funds toward those people, and then uh, you you, li you literally go bankrupt. So it's it's a it's literally fast-paced Darwinism in action in a, in a way that is fairly brutal. 
And um, in ways that those, you know, long-term prediction, that's, that's also the, the sort of things that people don't realize supply chains, that there are ma many companies that can survive for decades, not because they are very, very good, beca because they are such an incredible inertia in having, in setting up the infrastructure, updating the practices and whatnot, that you can stay super inefficient for one decade or not before it makes even a dent. I mean, many, for example, uh, a lot of retailers, um, I would say, went to the internet to set up their web store two decades late after Amazon. And they were, they, 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 they only, I would say, suffered a lot instead of just disappearing. In, in finance, there were plenty of things. If you're two decades late to the party, you're <laughs> that, that's just uh, unbearable. And um, so my, my, what I'm getting is that uh, it's, it's very interesting because you see this take of, of, uh, of getting people out of the way. It's uh, right now, in, um, in, uh, again, from the, the supply chain background, is that when it comes to think about the future, one of the most popular methods is still SNOP. And SNOP means sales and operation. It means that let's have all the people together in the room and discuss so that through the discussion, the proper forecast will emerge. And uh, from your quant, uh, from, I would say, your quantitative trader perspective, would that sound like a reasonable option? Like, uh, we want to, to perform well, let's, let's bring 20 people in the room, let's have a look at those charts and then make a vote to decide, you know, the, 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 the forecast, you know, with bonus points if you have, like, a, a, a higher rank. So you, your, your, your vote counts more if in the organigram. You're, high, you're, you're ranked higher up. It certainly sounds like a very, very strong prior, doesn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I don't, I don't envy um, people who are in the position of making, you know, one or two year ahead forecasts. And so forth. it's, obviously, it's a tricky game. Um, it's, and, and the the question of collective intelligence amongst humans. Um, in that sort of prediction task and how you accomplish that. Uh, it certainly has an interesting um, literature. But uh, I, I do feel that sometimes um, there's a simple fact that, the, at least in the US, um, our kind of puritanical bias is simply getting in the way of a pretty obvious solution. I mean, you know, I grew up in Australia, and if you want to know if you know, two flies are crawling up a wall, which one's going to get there first? You let people bet on it. It's really that simple. <laughs> Let's not overcomplicate this. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, best, the best prediction device, the first great prediction device, nobody knows this, um, was built. It was the size of a building. It was built in Ellers Ellerslie Racecourse and opened, I think, in 1913. And it was the world's first mechanical totalizator machine. And the punters could come in and they could place their bets on horses and these, uh, you know, levers would, would move and, uh, you know, these giant sort of pistons would, would slowly rise up in the air to let people know how much was bet on each horse and this kind of thing. Um, and, and through this amazing mechanical apparatus, probability arose. You know, the first example of risk-neutral probability kind of defined in a real-time information processing system. Um, nobody's beaten that uh, in 100 years. That is still the only really reasonable way to arrive at, at future probabilities of events, as far as I'm aware. I don't think there's been a better invention. Yeah, and, and one point that is very interesting to me is that you're pointing out that it is a, a discovery mechanism, you know, that's at play. That's what we are talking about. And that's that there is ingenuity in that. And thus, um, it, is, it is not necessarily what is really worth, is not necessarily the sort of... Um, uh, um, model that goes with it, or the sort of, uh, you know, human insight, etc. But that, that has having a, a pro, um, an approach where you think, what is my discovery mechanism to gain more reliable information about this future? Is there even something that acts as a discovery mechanism, or I am just making things up and uh, declaring those things, those statements that I'm making implicitly or not about the future as, you know, uh, as, as, as good and valid before there is even considering that, uh, that there might be something of a journey to get there, but not any kind of a journey, something that has been engineered with this discovery uh, in mind. And that's, that's, that's a bit... Yeah. That's a great way of putting it. 
Yeah, you have one mechanism that's been tested in and out in a thousand different places for a century, and it just keeps working. Um, and people will constantly come along and say, well, wait, there's something else we can do. Like your, your great example of uh, compensated weighted opinions in a room looking at a spread. Well, maybe that's <laughs> the right mechanism for prediction. Who knows? Um, look at the history. Um, if you if you look at, you know, I started my career in 2001 in, in, in credits and I, I lived through the 2006 um, experience. Uh, you had a market that was providing an implied correlation number that told you what the market's view, what the interdealer market's view was on the relative codependence of, you know, one company's fortunes and another. And let's say that number was 30%, just to, you know, it'd be a digression to define that precisely, but let's say, you know, the market thought, you know, IBM and Dell going bankrupt, 30% relationship. Uh, the rating agencies took an actuarial approach just like the M6 participants, they ignored the market information. Almost as a philosophy said, no, no, we, we can't use that in our data. They came up with their own model in ignorance of this. And even in ignorance, frankly, of the mathematics sometimes required to recognize the information. And they told the institutional investors that the number was, what do you think? Not 30%, not even 20%. They told, they told them the number was like 5%. That's a, a huge discrepancy in a, in a number. Um, so, you know, in the M6, there's, there's people looking at the data, but they're probably doing, you know, something halfway reasonable to come up with the, the volatil relative volatilities of the stocks and ETFs in that portfolio. Um, but they're ignoring the implied number, the implied volatility of those stocks. Same thing happened in 2006. Uh, People investing in CDOs, CDO squares, they, they ignored a different implied number, a slightly more complicated implied number, but not very complicated. They, they ignored the implied correlation number. And um, that's, you know, to me, really the story of, of, of how that disaster unfolded. Um, so getting back to your point, there have been lots of examples of people in the room, compensated, weighted assessment of the future. How has this panned out? other than a global financial crisis, other than a bunch of other disasters, I'm sure you could list in, in supply chain, how long is it going to take us to realize that the market is the only way? <laughs> I mean, how, yeah, many, but, how many yeah. examples do you need? The, the funny thing is that uh, there is some sort of, you know, um, th there was, uh, there is some sort of, of I would say, um, again, uh, uh, partial insanity going on. One of the, uh, just to give an example, in, in retail, Locat is working with many large retailers, and, uh, and typically when it comes to forecast the impact of promotions, so you, you, you're just going to do a promotion, let's say this chocolate bar, 30% off. And when people go into the motion of organizing a promotion, they are, I would say, fairly enthusiastic about the effect. They want to you know, uh, uh, move the needle, acquire market share. So a promotion is operationally, you know, it takes efforts, you, you, you need to, uh, to invest, you're going to uh, advertise, etc. Et and so, um, what I've observed, and again, I think I've observed that more than a dozen times in my, my career, is that when you, we look at the promotion forecast, they are, the numbers are almost always inflated. Um, people come up with the sales are going to be three times as much as the normal amount of chocolate bars that are sold during the week, or four times, or whatever. And, uh, and it, it's very interesting because um, when you apply um, a, a super basic averaging models and you look at what the promotions did for the last two weeks, just because there is many retail chain that are doing, you know, two waves of promotions per month, so you have like plenty of observation. And you say, well, your promotions. Uh, on average, they are doing like plus 50%, which is nice, you know, this is a nice uplift. It, it do work if you lower the price, the demand rise, but it's not nowhere near, you know, uh, the sort of 3x, 4x that you, may, that you may plan. And once in a while, you know, once in a while, uh, one product out of 50 is going to have like a 10x, but it's going to be not that very impressive because if you have 10x the sales, it's, it means that in half a day, you run out of stock, and then you end up kind of extrapolating your 10x based on the fact that you only sold the product for a few hours before 
heating the stock out. So the rest is kind of a, a, a mathematical exercise to extrapolate what would have happened if you've actually sold the thing for the week. Uh, the reality is that you, you ran out of stock very quickly, so, so you don't get to see the full, uh, the full picture. But the, the interesting thing is, and the point was, this, this distortion of, for example, of having this mechanism, you have a promotion, as people need to invest a lot of effort to make it happen, and yes, the logistics of it are a bit complex, there is, an, uh, um, I have observed that, an inflated expectations, and the interesting thing is that it becomes very difficult, and when you actually show up the model that's, well, on average, you know, you've, um, I mean, it, your 10x scenario might happen, but it's like a 1% chance. The rest is, is much more conservative. Uh, you, uh, it ends up a bit, you know, people feel it a bit as diminishing both of the enthusiasm of the people, you know, as if you're, you're, uh, you're, you're the, the, the really unfunny accountant that is, you know, uh, <laughs> I would say, um, uh, that, that, is, that has such a pessimistic and technocratic view on the problem, and also kind of diminishing the human intelligence as if people were not doing their job, because obviously a promotion, they, they, they took it as a, a, um, a measure of their own success if it's going to be, you know, a big hit. So if it's just 50%, in a way, it is halfway, uh, it's, it's actually an average promotion, so it's just fine, you know. Uh, and, and for me, it goes back to the sort of bias that when you ask people about, uh, are you an average driver? And, uh, and you will have 90% of the people who say, no, I'm an above average driver. <laughs> and that, that is the sort of thing that goes into play. And uh, again, that's that kind of my perception. And I see that quantitative traders have managed somehow to you know, break this barrier and, uh, and put those things in production. Uh, where it's, it's things that are largely automated, under human supervision, under human insights, but where I believe that, again, that would be for the supply chain audience, it is a fair assessment that nowadays in, in quantity finance, you know, people do not micromanage the, the output. They might actually play with the model, modify the model, and do all sorts of things, but, uh, but I, I believe that nowadays, un unless you know, there is something very special, the, the default, the default uh, modus operandi is to, once you've decided to pick some sort of automation, to let this thing run, unless you want to change it for something else. But you would not interfere with the output, manually interfering with the results. I don't know. Is it, is it what is really happening, or are there... Well, look, I mean, it, you know, in computer science, the old, it's the old maxim, right? You write the test first. And uh, nobody writes the test first when it comes to, to, to forecasting or, or making <laughs> predictions of the future, right? Um, uh, and only about 5% of time do they write the test afterwards. <laughs> do, they, do they ever even go back in a, in a um, rigorous way and look at what they've actually done? Um, yes, it's uh, markets have... For all their flaws, um, markets have an incredible way of supplying discipline. Um, you know, there's a reason that some top hedge funds, in their sort of intake, they, you know, send people to a poker camp or something, right? I mean, uh, you know, I, I grew up in trying to dabble in gambling markets of various kinds and trying to add things. And if you don't have that discipline, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get better at predicting things. You're really not. So how do we? Create that discipline. Uh, you know, we don't want to. We don't want the EU to mandate that everybody puts their model residuals on the blockchain. Um, that would be inefficient for various reasons. Um, I think we can maybe encourage uh, people to to think about how they could wield things that are like markets, that may be more lightweight, and, and start thinking about how they could fit into their existing data science pipelines. Uh, we could start to say people, encourage people to say, hey, look, um, what are you doing actually with the errors in your prediction models? Where do they go? Do they get thrown in the trash? Um, what, you know, make them public. Heck, uh, are they really that proprietary? Uh, think about it. Most people don't even know what your, what your model is or what you're modeling or how you used to do it. And you're producing something that you claim is noise, right? That's the definition. If you've made a prediction, and then you see what actually happens. 
then if you've done a good probabilistic model, there should be a way for you to turn a real world data stream into one that is essentially white noise, that is, you know, N01 numbers, <laughs> normally distributed numbers that nobody can find signal in. Well, what are you afraid of? I mean, <laughs> so, you know, that's that may be one approach. Um, you know, the prediction markets area is, is certainly interesting. Um, and at least in the US, it's been pretty much hobbled over the years by, by regulation. Uh, all sorts of people have tried to use this discipline, even, you know, DARPA has done various things and then sort of pulled back. And um, of course it comes up against the, the G word, gambling, and, 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 you know, for things to work well, you need staking sometimes. Uh, so there's, there's, there can be a cost, right? There's, you don't, you don't necessarily want to, you know, turn the world into uh, poker machines. But without some kind of market discipline, I, I don't see it getting any better, ever. I, I just see a repetition of things. And, and the reason is that, you know, not to pick on anyone, but um, the top statisticians in the world are not immune from this. Uh, I had a discussion um, with some of, some of Andy Gilman's team uh you know, about the economist model uh, before the Trump election, by the way. I wrote about it before the election, not after. And uh, I said to them, look, you've got Trump at 20 to 1. What's going on here? You know, he's, he's 2 to 1 on Betfair, so, and he's 20 to 1 in your model. What, what, what gives? And, and I even sent them something. I said, look, um, I noticed something interesting about these polls, and I was looking at some polls by some bad, bad pollsters, right? So bad polling companies um, that have poor ratings. The thing about those polling uh, companies is that I looked at in the previous election whether they picked up a late swing uh, to Trump. And uh, some of them had, and some of the ones who picked up that late swing were bad polling companies, not good ones. So they were downweighted in most of the models. Um, and I said, look, this is an interesting little effect here. Is there anywhere, is there anything in your Bayesian model, uh, which is as sophisticated as you could hope for, certainly a much better model than you'd find in a typical data science application, right, industry? Is there anything here that accounts for this? No. Um, why have you got him at 20 to 1? No. And then I had a, a, a bit of a, a spat with one of the guys in the Economist model. I said, are you going to give me 20 to 1 on Trump? Will you give me 20 to 1 on Trump? Can I put 50 bucks down? Of course not. Right? So, so why, do we, why do we play this game over and over again? Why do we believe in models, whether they're celebrity models or a model that's put in a pipeline somewhere by Dilbert, the data scientist? Why does anyone believe it? When you have something better, I don't know. And by the way, one of the things, I, I think you, you're touching something very important and also something that um, I've, uh, I, I, I promised the audience we did not consider this line of discussion pr beforehand, <laughs> but something that I've been advocating for, for, for decades is that if you do not have a feedback loop from the real world, from, you know, your, when you operate in your mathematical space, you know, statistical models and whatnot, algorithms, if you don't have a feedback loop from the real world, then um, you don't know whether you're doing things that are insane or not. Mathematics, I mean, people misunderstand as, you know, mathematics as telling the truth. The, mathematics only tells you consistency, you know, mm -hmm. whether when, when, when what you're doing inside this mathematical space is consistent uh, with itself, not with the world. And so if you do not have a feedback loop, you don't know. You, at best, if you're statistically and mathematically correct, that just means that you're consistent with yourself, which is good. It is better than being all the way inconsistent and nonsensical. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't say anything about, you know, the world at large. And, um, and here, when you were saying, you know, have, have, uh, uh, would you be willing to bet a few euros or dollars on the case? It's literally the, the feedback loop. That's the punishment, you know, the mm -hmm. reward and the punishment. So suddenly there are stakes and um, to uh, skin in the game. And in supply chain, one of the problem with those um, forecasting exercises is that they are typically entirely disconnected from what people are doing in, uh, and that's, that's something, that, a problem that I've identified is that most companies nowadays, they have literally one team doing the forecasting. So those people, you know, produce time series forecasts. And then uh, the rest of the company deal with the consequences. And, uh, and, and so you end up with this sort of, of, of very weird practices where uh, uh, sales, so salespeople, 
are going to, when they have to contribute to the sales, to the forecast, they are going to uh, vastly uh, under forecast. That's, the process is called, ha, has even a name called sandbagging. Why? Because if you forecast that your quota as a salesperson is 100, but you're very confident that you're going to sell 200, then you're going to exceed your quota and have your bonus because you exceed expectation or whatnot. And then uh, production is the other opposite. It's uh, if you uh, forecast super high, then you get all the budget to ramp up your production apparatus and everything. And so <laughs> if you have you know, a factory that can produce twice as much as what you in the end needs, the production is, all, is super smooth because you, your, your capacity are way beyond what you actually need. And so you have all those sorts of things. And again, the problem here is not that people are playing these games, is that uh, it's, it's to have the feedback loop engineered in a way that uh, people suffer the consequence in a way. I'm saying that you, you don't necessarily have to go all the way in having the, the money of the people at stake. You know, sometimes you, 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 you don't need, need to go all the way, but to have some, some feedback loop that connects with real world consequences so that you don't have um, uh, predictive models in the general sense that operate in a vacuum. You want them grounded. And, and I believe that those, those sort of uh, uh, financial attachment, you know, betting contests and whatnot, this is one of the most incredibly straightforward and grounded way to, to achieve that. And, and operationally, it is also relatively simple to execute as well. There was one, um, well, was one very good entrant in the M6 uh, contest, come, you know, just to come back to that, I'll call it the, we'll call it the Philip model. Um, and, uh, and what, and, uh, you know, did very well and won uh, to his credit. And an important part of his approach was to go out and find more data. So he wasn't content with the, the stocks and the ETFs that were provided by the organizers. He went out and found more data and uh, built models and so, saw how they performed against this uh, much broader universe. And, and that's you know another way of trying to put some discipline onto your modeling approach. So when you come back and look at that subset for the, the M6, you're, you're much less inclined to overfit to that particular history. Um, so I would agree very much with your point that um, what we think of today as, as markets doesn't have to be the exact mechanism. Um, frankly, I think prediction markets are pretty cumbersome and they're designed for humans and things like this. And I, I don't, I'm not particularly a huge fan um, in that respect. Uh, people tend to associate them with these sort of one-off events and it's hard to put bulky things um, into a pipeline, right? You can't put the New York Stock Exchange into your data science pipeline. Um, so you have to come up with these lightweight things and they may involve not having any staking, for instance. In Microprediction.org, there's no staking. It doesn't matter. Um, if there's enough data points, the, the cream rises to the top anyway. Um, so yeah, I think that's the challenge. It's, uh, I, you know, in my... Um, you know, I have a, a book on the topic, of course, and uh, I, I, for want of a better word, maybe I'm not good at inventing words, but I think of these as micromanagers. You know, some kind of autonomous mechanism that's capable of receiving or soliciting predictions, um, serving some upstream purpose for a business application or another micromanager, since we're talking supply chains, mm -hmm. and is capable of rewarding those contributions and judging them in a sensible way. And of course, combining them in a sensible way. Um, there are lots of different mechanisms for doing that. Uh, Microprediction.org has a kind of unique microstructure. It's sort of like a continuous lottery or a little bit like a parimutuel on, on a continuum. And uh, there's, a, there's a distribution at any given point in time, which is everybody's collective distribution of the future of the value, you know, tomorrow's temperature or next hour's, you know, stock price. Now, um, it's out there and if you think it's wrong, and let's say you know the true world distribution P and the market is distribution is Q, then it turns out you can get rewarded for that. And the, the average amount of credits you're gonna earn per unit time is actually interesting, really related to the KL distance between the true distance and, and the market's one. Um, so that's a different kind of mechanism. We have an incentive to drive 
the collective distribution towards the true one. So, you know, as you know, as you know better than me, there's a, there's a big world out there. There's a literature, the scoring of literature that can give you um, advice and characterizations of, you know, how to solicit point estimates. There's another literature for distributional ones and so forth. Um, there's, so, there's so many tools out there. You know, we just, it's more about culture. You know, the, the, the businesses want to have that discipline. Um, with the same discipline we've had in finance for 40 years. And in finance, you know, if someone makes, you have these consistent biases, um, as we mentioned, for um, making, you know, forecasts. Uh, well, yeah, and, and, and conversely, the, the bias for maybe sandbagging and the, uh, um, the expectations in public companies. Well, of course, the second one is taken care of, isn't it? I mean, you know, hedge funds have been all over that forever um, and, and, and correct for that bias. Um, but the first one isn't corrected for because there's no discipline. There's no market. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun, it's a fun problem to solve, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you're correct that it's 80% culture. What what makes it very difficult uh, from from the supply chain perspective is that um, supply chain is a fairly recent concept that emerged in the 90s, actually, and um, I'm proud to say that there was mostly about logistics, and and logistics. Interesting thing is that excellency in logistics means things completely different. It means basically having no people dying, you know, because they are drunk while driving a truck. It's, it's very mundane thing. So usually, if you want to have like excellent logistical process, it means doing the same thing over and over with eliminating all the source of obvious accidents, uh, of hazards. And, um, and it is very important, obviously, you don't want to have people you know, dying in your factories, dying while transporting your goods and whatnot. I mean, they, they, it is, it is and, and if you look over the last couple of decades, the amount of accidents in this sort of things that used to be you know, relatively dangerous professions of, 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 uh, of just moving stuff around in warehouses, um, now it is um, th those, those sort of, 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 of trade are very, very safe. So there has been a lot of progress for that. But then when you enter, that's, that's the logistics. So that's literally you know, making things happen on the ground. And supply chain is the discipline that emerged, but much more recently, on having the long view on the future and organizing everything ahead of time, you know, taking those decisions so that all the operations are executed in ways that are efficient. And the thing is that when you're starting to think about and that, that's what I heard, you know, all the sort of, of, of concepts, for example, you know, uh, Kyle distance, you know, callback labor distance. That's all, again, that's literally all sort of conceptual tools where you accept that the future is uncertain and thus you can work with uncertainty and you even have the, numer the, the mathematical instrument to work with that. And that's, that's the interesting thing is that um, when people, that, that was, by the way, the cultural challenge for supply chain, that's where I'm getting at, is that it's incredibly difficult because the logistics, the, you know, where supply chain emerge, the, the whole point was to remove uncertainty in a way. You don't want to have a probability of somebody dying on your watch. You, know, that's, you, you want this probability to be zero or, or you know, zero risk is almost impossible, but something that is so vanishingly small that when it happened, it's really, really something that honestly it was almost impossible to prevent you know that's uh, uh the lightning stri striking t three times at the same spot you know these sort of things uh, so people and that's that's good you want to have something where you have like certainty in your processes but then when you want to when you evolve into this supply chain sort of mindset where you're thinking years ahead and suddenly you know, this do not apply. You cannot obtain those certainty for things that are about to happen, you know, years from now. Uh, and thus, uh, there is this, this, cultural, this culture that needs to be re-engineered because having complete certainty, engineering this complete certainty is very good on the ground for your operation, but it's a completely different game when you start thinking about the future, especially, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the future, like uh, not the immediate future, but a bit beyond. And, uh, and I agree with you that it's very much a cultural thing. I don't know, I mean, maybe one random question. Uh, 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 that was before your time, as far as I know, but would you, would you estimate you know, how much time it took for finance you know, to, to embrace during the course of the 20th century this sort of um, you know, uh, more e elaborate uh, you know, 
probabilistic vision of the future. I believe that values at risk, those sort of instruments were in, 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 uh, introduced in the 80s, but I'm not, you know, again, I'm not 100% sure about my timing. Uh, that's a, it's a good question. Of course, um, options markets existed well before then, uh, and a lot of people had a, a pretty good grasp on uh, what was going on. I think there's, there's always been smart people out there, and uh, whether they published or not, <laughs> um, you know, those who think data science is 10 years old, um, they, they probably should read the Jim Simon's uh, you know, <laughs> biography uh, to, to recognize that it's not, it's not 10 years old. It's, it's at least in earnest 40 years old and, and at least longer than that. And so, um, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not a historian in that sense, but if you talking about this discipline and the notion of uh, probabilities being pushed into the right place by people essentially wagering on them. Um, not only is that an old idea, as, as I pointed out, it was, it was implemented 100 years ago. Um, it's actually an important part of at least the philosophy of the foundations of probability itself, at least coming from some perspective. So if you, if you were to read, you know, uh, Definetti's writings from the 1920s, uh, he has this, essentially this, I would call it almost, he's Italian, but a, a little bit of an Australian exasperation, I think, where he's saying, oh, probability does not exist, right? <laughs> unless, unless somebody's betting on it. <laughs> that's, that's my, uh, and then of course he gets into what, I think what today would probably be called the, sort of the Dutch book philosophy of probability. So, um, there's this notion of, uh, probability being dollars is a very, very old one. And the notion that uh, probabilities are unreliable if they're not dollars is also very old. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, well, actually, just one Sorry. last question just to come back and tie it together, because I was curious about the implications of the M6, because, of course, the, the hypothesis was you were trying to find out whether or not it was, in fact, possible to beat the stock market. And I'm just curious, because we've talked about um, the inferiority of, let's say, uh, democratic decision making when it comes to, let's say, supply chains. But on an individual level, historically, there have been many people who have managed, like Warren Buffett, to consistently beat the stock market. So again, to tie all that together in a question, did the M6 demonstrate that, yeah, on a, it, it is possible to beat the market and better than other people have historically done for six plus decades? The, the problem with the problem with that, and it's a very important distinction to make, is that, first of all, Warren Buffett would not have finished in the top 10. Warren Buffett would have had probably horribly calibrated estimates of probability. And, and that's, that's fine. That's not his skill set. Um, there's a difference between being able to beat the market and take nothing away from Warren Buffett and his incredible longitudinal performance. But Warren Buffett is, think of him as one little correction to the market you know his his money is just making the market a little bit more efficient uh, but the market supplies right now a probability of where any given stock price is going to be three days from now or 30 days from now beautiful distribution um, which you can back out with a few caveats um, warren buffett on his own can't create any model which standalone is going to give the same or better probabilistic estimates as the market can. Uh, neither can Jim Simons, uh, neither can any given single hedge fund. And so I would say that's one important point. The, the second point is that M6 is a contest and it is a collection of individual efforts to create probabilities. But a market is much more than that. The market is a combination of, of people adding to that distribution in their own individual ways, fixing small parts of it. Maybe I think there's something wrong in the tail. Maybe there's something wrong on Wednesday, right? It's very different. It's a collective activity and you can't beat that collective activity. Um, and so I think the, um, my take from the M6, first of all, I expected to find some smart people in the M6. And, and so check that box. I, all, all credit to some, you know, in particular Philip who beat me fair and square. Um, 
But if you look at a, a numerical simulation, it's, it's impossible to say that Philip was actually better than me, or vice versa. Um, and the overall performance of the options market in the M6 is kind of overwhelming. I mean, there was a pilot stage, there was quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. In every single, you know, five out of five times, my entry was in the top quartile. Like, that's not luck. <laughs> so, so I think hopefully the M6, um, I hope teaches people that um, the discipline of the market is, uh, is, is, is just um, way up here compared to the discipline they used to in their, in their machine learning papers or their conferences or, or wherever else. Um, and I hope the moral is not, um, okay, well, that's too bad. Uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, let's stay away from the markets, you know, because they're, they're too hard to beat. Um, I, ho I hope the moral is a different one, that people start thinking about how they can use power of the markets or things like it or these feedback loops mm -hmm. um, in their own pipelines, in their own companies. Um, that, I hope, is what people take away from it. Um, I'm not sure if they will, but... <laughs> You know, one can only hope. I think that's uh, probably the end. I'll draw things to a close. Uh, Joanna, thank you for your time. Peter, thank you very much for yours and for your expertise, and congratulations again on the M6. And thank you at home for watching. We'll see you all next time.